This approach started to bloom at 70s due to an expansion of large corporations and development of strategic planning culture within a bureaucratic organizations. Simply, complex businesses required a highly educated individuals capable to deal with big data and having a direct access to the CEO. The approach acquired SWOT analysis and a philosophy of a fit between internal capabilities and external circumstances from the classic approach, but added its own tools, techniques and philosophy as well. With the essence, this is a highly formalized and structured process of a strategy formulation based on a clearly defined set of goals, budgets, operational plans and similar. At the essence, it's a formal, step-by-step approach, just like a cookbook consisting of objective setting, external audit, internal audit, strategy evaluation, operationalization and scheduling. Objective settings. The process starts with defining clear goals and objectives. However, on the contrary of a classic approach, here is the focus on goals defined at a quantitative manner. For example, targeted market share, desired EBITDA, return on capital employed, and similar. Next, external audit. Here is the point to estimate or predict the influences from the environment in order to prepare yourself. Yet, the estimates should be quantitative as well. For example, inflation, total market demand and supply, prices of inputs and competition, and similar. Later on, contribution from Porter's Five Forces framework was incorporated as well. Internal audit. The approach is focused on internal capabilities and competitive advantage as well. Since these are a bit judgmental, it's more in a form of a list or tables. It's difficult to quantify them directly, but uh, you can craft a very nice story for a PowerPoint instead. Strategy evaluation. At the heart of a strategy evaluation, there is a return on investment concept, later on described as a shareholder's value creation. Here is the idea to create a financial forecast for the next 5 or 10 years and derive a value that is going to be created from the standpoint of shareholders. Based on the results, it will be decided if the strategy is good enough to be selected and pursued. Financial modeling is a central instrument used in the evaluation process. Operationalization. Here is the point on sub-strategies, meaning defining a hierarchy of goals, budgets and programs. The process is focused on formulation, while on the implementation side there is a freedom to further decompose, elaborate and rationalize. Simply said, the focus here is to create a system of plans. Scheduling. Here is the focus on programming activities or creating timetables. This will be later on paired with respective budgets and responsible executors. However, These are just the basics. Advanced levels include the following frameworks. Scenario planning and strategic control. Scenario planning. This is a great add-on tool to regular strategic planning. Basically, different scenarios are developed through variations of certain assumptions regarding external environment or internal initiatives. The point here is not to answer what is the best possible scenario per se, but to prepare a strategist for different possibilities. For example, what if the prices of inputs go up, sales decline, there is a high inflation rate or similar. Financial model is a great tool to give a fast answers on all major potential issues and consequences, if set properly. Strategic control. This approach allows control on all three levels, meaning controlling the inputs or assumptions for strategy development, controlling the strategy process itself or defined set of steps, and later on controlling the outcomes or if the strategy is implemented well. From the controlling standpoint, it's relatively easy to understand if there is a problem with either strategy planning or its execution. So, what would be the key limitations of this approach? First of all, it's important to highlight that planning is an important aspect of strategy. 
Here is the critique focused on strategic planning as, in, as a sort of a discipline and its bureaucratic attempt to convert strategy into a too much structured and formalized process. The most important limitations refers to predetermination as a core value, remote control based on numbers, formalization versus creation, strategic planning versus programming and similar. Predetermination as a core value. The entire process starts with a set of assumptions about the circumstances for the next five years or similar. And that is the starting point for strategy making, believing that everything is going to happen as planned, meaning within acceptable omits. That may happen at a stable environment only. However, in most cases, that is not very probable since we are living at a time of huge uncertainties and unexpected changes in aspects like technology, price volatility, COVID-19, war in Ukraine and similar. Next, remote control based on numbers. The entire process is run by people sitting at the offices, alienated from operations and without direct contact with market players, either customers, suppliers or competitors. They are focused on self-proclaimed big picture, past numbers from the latest financial statements, market reports, interviews with managers and similar believing they have a proper, unfiltered and accurate tools. Next, formalization versus creation. Here is the belief that strategy is just another job in a company. It might be standardized. That is why it is separated to small chunks and repacked into a fancy strategy planning world. Yet, strategy is not just analysis. Creativity, among other things, is the key that makes the difference between leaders and an army of troopers. Creativity requires thinking out of the box, while the strategy planning is trying to put it into a box, into an efficient set of well-structured steps within a restricted timeline. Strategic planning versus programming. As Professor Minzberg stated, because analysis is not synthesis, Strategy planning has never been strategy making. Simply said, the essence is missing. It is useful to expand and a little bit adjust past performance and budgets into the next few years plan. Although that might be useful to assess missing resources and program certain activities and budgets, on a separate basis there should be done non-annual, opportunity-based strategy work. So, What would be the key benefits of this approach? The core idea here is to set direction and impose stability in the organization, which is very useful at predictable environment. It allows an easy process of communicating the key messages throughout a large organization by cascading down the organizational structure relevant goals, targets, budgets and timelines and similar. In addition, it looks great and professional when presented to investors. It seems that we have covered all the answers for them. Yet, at fast-changing circumstances, it only may help at understanding consequences. For example, how profitability will be affected if the sales drop for, let's say, 10%. And later on, different kind of strategists should step in by bringing creative and innovative solutions So, for example, how to sustain sales at least at the current level if the company is under pressure. This approach is great for strategic and performance control, especially in large diversified organizations. It allows managers of divisions or profit centers to be creative in a real strategy creation, while this regular strategy process will be used only to define targets, budgets and timelines as a milestones for those creative strategists. On the other hand, strategy planners will use these targets, budgets and timelines to evaluate proposed individual strategies, create consolidated plans and later on have a properly set measurement system to check if and where the discrepancies arise during the implementation. In addition, it has a great role in the process of restructuring as well, when one has to decide in which businesses to stay or which one to sell. On top of that, this approach opens the doors for other participants in strategy creation process. It's no longer all about a CEO as an ultimate strategist. 
with his core team, analysts, consultants, and others.